Adventure is not irresponsible. Adventure is not irresponsible. When I was 21 years old, I graduated from college and I was immediately offered a job. But I turned the job down because my plan was to hike the Appalachian Trail. And when I told my would-be employer of that decision, he looked at me and he said, you need to seriously think about what it is that you're running away from. <laughs> running away? This was the first time in my life when I felt like I was going in the direction that I wanted. It seems to me that our culture, our society, has forgotten the value of a journey. Historically, youths were encouraged to take journeys, or walkabouts, or a pilgrimage. It was seen as a transition into adulthood. But nowadays, our society is so fast-paced that we jump from one thing to the next without pause, without preparation, and without reflection. The truth is, when I was 21 years old, I had no clue who I was or what I wanted to do. And instead of starting a job, I knew I wouldn't like or sinking 80 grand into a master's degree that I might not use. I decided to take some time and go try to find some answers. And I went looking for those answers on the Appalachian Trail. The Appalachian Trail is a 2,185 mile footpath that spans through 14 states between Georgia and Maine. And each year about 2,500 people will go out and try to complete the entire trail. Now of the folks who start, only 25% will finish. I wanted to be one of the 25%. I wanted to finish. But somehow, I neglected to learn how to backpack before starting the trail. <laughs> In my 21-year-old brain, I figured that hiking was technically just walking, so how hard could it be? I learned very quickly that hiking was the hardest thing I had ever done. I mean, walking up mountains all day with blisters on your feet and a heavy pack on your shoulders is not only exhausting, it's demoralizing. But after several weeks, I made it up to the Smoky Mountain National Park, and I was excited to be there because I knew that the Smoky Mountain National Park was actually the most visited national park in the entire country. So I figured if all those folks were going to the Smokies, there must be something worth seeing. And I hoped for great views and wildflowers and maybe even wildlife from a distance. But instead, the entire time I was walking through the park, it was like I was stuck in a gray cloud. It was foggy, it was misty, it was rainy, and my last night inside the park, I was camped at a three-sided wooden trail shelter. And I went to bed listening to the sound of rain fall on the shelter roof. Now the next morning when I woke up, the first thought that went through my head is, oh, yes, I don't hear the rain, it must have stopped. And then I looked outside. Snow. <laughs> Six inches had already accumulated on the ground, and it was coming down in blizzard-like conditions. I didn't have what I needed to be stuck in the Smokies in a blizzard. I had to get out of the park. Based on my guidebook, if I could go 18 more miles, I would get to a road where there was a hiker hostel, and I would be safe. So immediately I started to pack up, and when I saw my shoes, I discovered that the laces were covered in ice. I couldn't tie or untie them, so eventually I stomped them on, threw on my pack, and then started down the trail. Now hiking is difficult, we've established that, but hiking the Appalachian Trail in a snowstorm is nearly impossible. Not only are you willing your way through the wind currents and snow drifts, but the entire time you're looking for a camouflaged trail marker. You see, the entire 2,000 plus mile trail is marked with one symbol, a white rectangle. <laughs> so there I am in a blizzard, looking for two by six inch painted white blazes on trees that are covered in snow. But at least the time,
time the trail was in the forest. And in the forest, the trees kind of protected me from the wind and the precipitation. Then the trail left the forest, and I went out on an exposed ridge line. And as soon as I left the tree cover, I felt the, the wind and the wintry mix hitting my face, and it burned. Instinctually, I ducked my head, I closed my left eye, and I kept going as quickly as I could to get back in the forest. But when I made it there, I lifted my head, but something was wrong. I couldn't open my eye. It had literally frozen shut. And I had to stand there and pick icicles off of my eyelashes. I had to wipe frozen crust from the corner of my eye until I could once again lift my eyelid, regain my sight, and keep hiking down the mountain. Now, after a very long day with several wrong turns, I made it to the hiker hostel. I was safe. But that day, I learned what it felt like to be utterly lost and confused. I also learned that it, it doesn't matter how hard you try, it doesn't matter how much energy you put forth if you are headed in the wrong direction. Hiking through the Smokies in a blizzard with one eye frozen shut taught me that I needed vision and I wanted direction on and off the trail. On the AT, I had maps and blazes to show me the way, but off the trail, I learned how to implement short and long-term goals into my life and into my career. And when I'm working towards those goals, I almost always need help from other people. Thankfully, the Appalachian Trail taught me a lot about working with other people. You see, when you're out there hiking, you're gonna meet folks who are all different ages, they have different backgrounds, different beliefs. In fact, as far as age is concerned, the youngest person ever to do the trail all at once was just a five-year-old boy. On the other hand, the oldest person to complete the trail all at once was an 83-year-old. But within that range, the two main groups on the trail are folks right out of college and then individuals who have recently retired. Because those are the two times in life where you can go and take a six-month hike. But I think it's more than just that. You see, adventure allows the young to feel confident. It teaches them the value of commitment. On the other hand, adventure allows the more mature members of society to feel capable and it teaches them to remain flexible. It doesn't matter how old you are, you're never too young to set goals and you're never too old to dream dreams. When I was out on the trail, I was relieved to meet other people my age and realize that they didn't have it all figured out either. But more than that, I was fortunate to spend a lot of time and a lot of miles with folks in their 50s, 60s, 70s, because they had a lifetime's worth of experience and knowledge. And on the trail, they had time to share their stories. The trail doesn't teach you to be a good listener. The trail forces you to be a good listener. Because without distractions, I mean, without homework, work commitments, TVs in the background, music blaring, cell phones going off. You get to know people really well, really quickly. And it occurred to me that everyone I met knew something that I didn't know and could do something that I couldn't do. Spending time with other people was a way of investing in myself. However, I will say, there was one time in Virginia <laughs> When I met another hiker, and he was a young man around my age, and we walked and talked and had a really interesting conversation, but by the end of the day, I was prepared to head off on my own. And I used all my usual party methods, but nothing seemed to work. It became very clear very quickly that this guy really wanted to hike with me. And being the good southerner, I did not want to be direct, and I definitely didn't want to hurt his feelings, so I decided I'd give him some hints or clues about how I felt. So 
So I looked at this other hiker and I said, gosh, you know what? I really like hiking by myself. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, yeah, me too. <laughs> and he kept following me. So a little while later, I, I tried again and this time I said, um, gee, you know what? I am so glad that I don't have a hiking partner. And he looked at me and he said, yeah, me too. And he kept following me for six days. And I tried everything I could think of. I tried going fast, he kept up. I tried hiking very slowly, he was very patient. Finally, after nearly a week of this, I was fed up, I was frustrated, and clearly I was desperate. Because when there was a brief break where I didn't see him right behind me, I thought to myself, this is it, this is my chance, and I have got to escape. So what do you do if you're trying to escape from someone on the Appalachian Trail? Run and hide. <laughs> Run and hide. I sprinted off trail, got on all fours with my pack still on, climbed underneath the rhododendron tree. And I was lying there with my face pressed against the dirt, looking up at the trail, praying this guy was gonna pass without seeing me, when all of a sudden I realized, this is the most pathetic I have ever felt in my entire life. I was out there lying in the dirt, trying to avoid the only human contact within miles. And why? Because I couldn't be direct, because I couldn't be honest or authentic from the beginning. And what would have been worse, hurting his feelings six days ago or having him see me hide underneath the rhododendron tree? So I vowed right then and there that I would always be direct, that I would always communicate clearly with other individuals. And since that time, I've spent a lot less of my time hiding from other people and also less time hiding from my thoughts and emotions. Now after two and a half months, I made it up to Pennsylvania. And on one hand, I was excited because I had come over a thousand miles. But on the other hand, I was discouraged because I still had over a thousand miles left to go. And Pennsylvania is tough. It's known for its rocks. It's like all the other states took all their rocks and just dumped them <laughs> in Pennsylvania. So your feet hurt because all day you're walking on sharp, jagged edges, but also your neck hurts because you're forced to look down, hoping that you don't sprain an ankle. When I was in Pennsylvania, I told myself, things will get easier when you get out of the rocks. Things will get better when you get farther north. <laughs> then I got up to Massachusetts, and up until Massachusetts, I had only gotten two bug bites the entire trip. My first day in MA, I got 137 mosquito bites. And that was before discovering the biting black flies of northern New England which are way worse than mosquitoes. <laughs> Honestly, it took until Vermont. It took me 12 states and over 1,600 miles to realize that the trail was never going to get easier. <laughs> the trail was innately difficult and Mother Nature didn't owe me anything. The only thing I could change, the only thing I could control was myself. I couldn't change my environment, but I could control my response. And when I realized that, the trail did not get any easier, but I started to enjoy it a whole lot more. And after five months, I made it to the last mountain. And when I got there, I was a completely different person, but I liked the woman at the end a heck of a lot more than the girl who had started. Because of the trail, I now value simplicity. I mean, I knew I could be happy and content with just the items I carried in a pack on my back. I now value quality relationships. The trail was the first environment I had been a part of 
where the people who were the closest to me were extremely different from me. And that made life really fun and really interesting. But surprisingly, and I'm, I'm going to say surprisingly, because when I started the trail, I was terrified that I was going to be bored and lonely. But surprisingly, when it was over, I immediately longed for the silence and the solitude that I had discovered. But the thing I miss most of all doesn't seem to make sense because I really missed how beautiful I felt on the trail. And that does not make sense because when I was on the trail, I was filthy. I mean, I was covered in dirt and scrapes and bug bites and bruises. But for five months, I didn't have a mirror. And I also didn't have billboards or magazines or commercials telling me what I should look like. So I started to see myself in a whole new way. I started to see myself through my interactions with other hikers. So if I made someone else smile, that made me feel pretty. And growing up, I had always thought that nature was beautiful. But I had never seen myself as a part of nature. I had never seen myself as a part of all that beauty until I hiked the trail. And after walking over 2,000 miles, after hiking through 14 states, you better believe that I based my self-worth a whole lot less on how I looked and a whole lot more on what I could do. And the trail made me realize that I could do so much more than I once thought was possible. We can all do so much more than what we think is possible. <laughs> Adventure is healthy. It's healthy for your hearts and your minds. Adventure is also an education. I guarantee you that adventure is responsible. And the good news is, adventure is waiting. <laughs>